Hello, everyone. I'm Barrett Anderson, COO of Strategic News Service and Future in Review. And I'm here today with my old friend and former colleague, Elliot Pepper, who also happens to be a fantastic author. Um, he has written 10 novels, including this most recent book, Reaper. Um, and uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Reaper, which is coming out May 18th. Um, it is really a page turner if you are looking for something that's just like a fantastic, thought provoking, fun book to read. I highly recommend it. And we're going to talk more about what, what goes on in the book without hopefully giving too much away. We'll avoid, try to avoid the spoilers. But um, I'm curious, uh, Elliot, we, you and I, so this, is, this book is very interesting to me because it follows kind of um, this group of interconnected creators of all kinds, entrepreneurs, media professionals, uh, really smart people who are all caught up in this network of power. Um, and I'm curious if you could talk, you know, you've got this section in the back where you talk about what it was like to write that kind of story. It's a little bit different than I think some of what you've written before. And I think the thing that struck me the most about, you know, you are a science fiction author and so often science fiction is very future focused and set very far in the future. This book actually felt very much in the present. Mm. And, you know, there are some future, futuristic technologies in it, but a lot of what is, is focused on is, is are things that people are wrestling with right now. And I'm curious if that was an intentional choice for you or how, how you kind of thought about that. Yeah, so to me, uh, so I always think of myself as a reader first and a writer second. So I've been a science fiction reader my entire life. And uh, as well, I mean, as well as uh, many other genres. Um, and one of the things that I love so much about science fiction is that it, it gives me the feeling as a reader that I am seeing, a, that I'm exploring a new world or seeing a familiar world through fresh eyes, that, that it reveals the strangeness of uh, either the invented world or the sort of naturalistic world that's portrayed in the story. And so one of the things I was hoping to do with Reaper was to, uh, like, frankly, I think that um, the reality we live in is is so strange, <laughs> yeah. so so <laughs> profoundly weird um, that it that it, it's far stranger than anything I can invent from whole cloth. And so one of the things I was trying to do in Reaper was to tell a story that was a science fiction story that gave the reader that feeling of wonder and sort of surreality a little bit, but that brought that lens to, very much to like the world we happen to inhabit, which is, is so wonderful and terrible and full of beauty and pain and humor and all the rest. Yes. So, so I, I'm really delighted to hear, th yeah, th th that worked for you. <laughs> and, um, and that's definitely something I was thinking about as I wrote this particular story. So um, I think it would be remiss of me not to remind you of, you, you know, you, you say this thing about like, sometimes reality is weirder, stranger than, mm -hmm. uh, this, this brings to mind an experience that we both had a few years ago. <laughs> so Elliot and I <laughs> worked together as a part of a science fiction uh, investigative media company that I founded called Scout. Uh, with, and we, with a group of others, co-created co this political game uh, that was designed called the Machine Learning President uh, with uh, Mike Masnick, who runs TechDirt, and mm -hmm. Randy Lubin, who is a ga fantastic game designer, and Brett Horvath, who is my co-founder of Scout. Um, we, you know, we created this really incredible live action scenario planning game that was supposed to model the implications of technology on the 2020 election. Was that it? Yeah. Yeah, it was. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and we went, we played it at the interval, which is a, is a location in your novel. That's right. Uh, Long Now Foundation. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And as a result of staging that game, which had a you know a bunch of people came together to try to figure out, it was fun, it was interesting, it was kind of intriguing. And a few months later, uh, there was a, this article popped up mm -hmm. in the in the New Yorker, I believe. It yeah, was it was the New Yorker. Meyer writing yeah. about um, the 
the Mercer family. And it turned out that um, Rebecca Mercer <laughs> had taken this game, the rule set of this game to her Vail ski vacation or something like that. And they were writing this article about it, like, oh, she's playing this game that's focused on, she was, her family was a character that we created in this game. <laughs> Well, and so I, I, and she one of somehow the, wound up with a copy of the rules, and right. it was like it became this international media sensation. And we were like, "Hey, actually, that was our game. We didn't create it to make fun of democracy. We created it to try and help people understand how weird it is." Um, but it just that that experience that we, we, you know, I remember like us all being like, "How did she get that?" Like, where, right? We ran. I mean, the, the we ran it once. The game we ran the game once at the interval, yeah. and it was what forty people were there, yeah, which, and and everything was like, like physical that. copies, right? So, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, it went everywhere that summer. I mean, it was in the New Yorker, Vanity Fair. It was all over the place. And then, of course, like that sort of like weird splash of like self-referential <laughs> like like it was like the new the headlines were a, were something that could have happened in the game yeah um, and then uh and then we wound up because of that getting to run it a second time with cards against humanity in chicago yeah uh, with peter was, sagal i will never forget yeah. peter sagal as mike pence that was that was <laughs> I, yeah i can't that 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 is like in my memory forever it's beautiful yeah um yeah. My favorite, my favorite part was this, and this could have been a line in your novel as well. Yeah. When she found out, when she got all this negative attention about having the copy of the rules from from our game, uh -huh. she was, told a reporter, she was like, "Oh, I don't know how that got in my bag. I burned it anyways." <laughs> it yeah, like, and I, and I remember she accused her cleaning staff of, yeah. of leaking it to the mm -hmm. press. Um, anyway, yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, like, that's a great example of just how I actually that's not only a great example of how weird reality can be and how how contingent it is, right? Like, mm -hmm. uh, there's this like, like, if you had pitched that story as as a novel, it would have sounded like just ridiculous. implausible, just yeah. Yeah, ridiculous, like it wouldn't have worked. Um, and so uh, it, and so that like that, the, like the, that chain of cause and effect is so odd. And like following those is part of what's fun about writing novels too, right? Um, you're, you're trying to sort of like fabricate one from scratch. And then like another thing that that makes me think of that, that uh, connects back to what you were saying a few minutes ago is about how, so Reaper has five uh, point of view characters and their mm -hmm. stories are like interwoven. They all yeah. start out totally separate. There's a, a virologist, a VC, a quantum computer scientist, a podcaster, an assassin, right? And all of their stories sort of like come together over the course of the novel. And, um, and like one of the themes in the, the novel is just sort of how you can have these like small, seemingly arbitrary groups of people that really change the world, right? And that's actually, that, that's one of the things I remember thinking about while we were working on that game was we brought together these really small groups of people and then the sort of butterfly effects of we're, we're even kind spending of an evening together yeah, yeah. Were, were just so far beyond what I ever would have imagined uh, would be possible or whatever sort of have resulted from it. So yeah, no, I, I love it. I think about that a lot. That was a really tremendously fun project. I'm so glad we got to work on it together. Um, okay, so let's let's focus a little back in on 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 your your book here. We've got um, so I'm curious about like you this book has as a central theme a pandemic. You wrote it during a pandemic. Can you explain what it was like to write a novel about an unprecedented global pandemic during an unprecedented global <laughs> pandemic? And like, was that, you know, I know you went back after the pandemic happened and kind of rewrote pieces. Are there, are there parts of that that were planned beforehand? Was it, how much of it was influenced by? Yeah, so it was very eerie for me because the entire, so, um, uh, the book is not about a pandemic. It happens in the wake of one, right? right. So it's like after a, a pandemic has happened in the yeah. backstory of this world. Um, and, and the story takes place afterwards and with right. some of the follow on effects and sort of revealing some of the story behind it. Um, but what's really 
strange and what made, especially the beginning of the pandemic really weird for me is that I actually wrote and planned all of those sections in fall of 2019. So uh, I had been, you know, like there's a character who's a virologist who has a whole backstory that's sort of interwoven right. with that. And I had already, I'd been writing him for months. I had already written Jeff before. I, before yeah, I had written all started. of Jeff sections the character was already like completely fleshed out all his chapters were already there on the page and so then uh so i'd been writing about this virologist and sort of his his role in trying to respond to the pandemic and developing vaccines and all this kind of stuff and then you know uh probably six months four to six months after i had sort of been writing him California lockdown, right? Because COVID exploded. So uh, it was actually very strange. And it was particularly strange for me, like I've been talking to my wife about like different aspects of the story. And she's like, what is happening? Yeah, yeah, I was yeah, like, yeah, I, have, yeah. I have no idea. Stop like, writing it. Yeah, Stop writing. Yeah. So it really, it really did feel eerie because it felt like suddenly I was living through the backstory of the novel that I was in the middle of writing. Mm -hmm. um, which was really uh, strange. I, I, I mean, like, just That's, from a creative what process. Is the, what oh, is the ahead. real moment? Yeah. Like, I, I can't even imagine what that must have been like to be like locked down at home. No one knows what's going on. Everyone's terrified. And you're, you have basically, you know, written the aftermath of this effect of this yeah. giant event that's happening in real time. Yeah, and I have been doing tons of research on epidemiology and virology, virology to inform the character, right? Mm -hmm. So I had I had been like doing all this reading on on pandemics, like you know the fall before COVID, um, <laughs> and so yeah, I mean it was it was very weird. I think it was also the next time you write a novel, would you mind writing about like a flourishing, beautiful just utopias writing? from now on? Yeah, utopias yeah. from now on. Yeah, I promise. Ecologically <laughs> pristine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, so, so I, I think that you know one one interesting part of it too is that uh, writing a novel it's such a solitary art form, right? Like you're like I spend a lot of time by myself typing mm -hmm. and even more time uh, by myself just thinking, right? Like I'll, I take the dog on walks for a couple hours a day basically to like work through story problems. <laughs> and unlike, you know, if you're a comedian, um, you write the jokes. Feedback, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Like, like you're, you're testing it, you're going yeah. putting it in front of an audience. If you're a musician, you're often doing the same thing. You're like playing with riffs and then like maybe like trying it in front of people to see their reaction and that helps inform the art. Mm -hmm. um, but as a novelist, the feedback loops are really long. It's like, you know, I make things and I don't actually like hear feedback on them even from the first readers for often like a year and right. then like not from the broader audience for like a couple years. And so um, just as I think all of us at the beginning of COVID were so isolated by the, you know, by the pandemic, we were all living in just in our homes. Right. And, and, and there was, you know, social distancing and all the rest like that sort of like, Com combined with the natural sort of like solitary nature of writing a novel and then the novel being about a pandemic was just really weird. So it was a very strange human experience. Um, and I like, honestly, like one thing I'm really grateful for that I didn't change, didn't have to change, um, it, you know, now that Reaper is coming out two years, a little over two years after COVID sort of took off, um, is that it happens afterwards that it really this is the a post pandemic world that reaper is set in and right. i I'm, I'm really grateful for that creatively <laughs> because if i had like written a book set in the about midst during of it, a, like during oh a my pandemic. God. yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's very interesting okay so um i want to read like a, a quote you have all of these very interesting characters in your book and i think one of the things that i most appreciate about you as a writer is your ability to write complex characters with good intentions whose decisions result in really bad things happening, right? Um, and to present that kind of multifaceted aspect of humans that is so true of all of us, right? Like we may have good intentions, we may make decisions that cause 
suffering and pain to others. And that doesn't mean, you know, the, the separation between intention and um, uh, that, that word outcome. that's in my brain. What's yeah, that? outcome, yeah. I think is a really interesting conversation that's come up in a lot of cultural spaces in the last couple of years, especially in light of, you know, like the Me Too movement and, mm -hmm. and um, you know, thinking about white fragility and, and George Floyd and, and like racism and how we think about it, all of these things. There's this fluctuation and flow between like intention and actual outcome or impact um, that I think is very, a very kind of interesting um, like transition that society is making in some ways right now away from, oh, I didn't mean to do that to like, okay, but you did do it. Right. And here's what it caused, you know, here's what impact that had on me or the world or your, your whatever it might be. So. Um, I want to read a quote uh, about one of your characters, Sansom, who is kind of the central, uh, would you like to describe him? <laughs> sure. Um, Sansom, Sansom is, a, uh, is the world's leading venture capital investor. He runs a firm called Human Capital, and they invest in brilliant entrepreneurs, scientists, technologists, but unlike a traditional VC you might meet on Sand Hill Road today, um, uh, human capital also invests in artists. They invest in, in any sort of any kind of human innovator whose, uh, whose work, uh, who, who, where the impact and the profits of their work can scale according to power laws, can scale exponentially. And so that's Sansom. He, he, um, he really, he, he, he's really driven by um, empowering the, the, the folks he invests in. He wants them to change the world. He wants to help accelerate them into sort of like building their visions for a better future. And as you can sort of imagine, um, there's a dark side to that too. <laughs> All right, so this is a quote kind of, I think, in reference to Sansom, and I'm just um, from page 92. Um, this, is a, this is from the perspective, told from the perspective of Jeff, the, the virologist character. Um, this was where dedicating your life to science got you. He had become nothing more than a celebrated tool of powerful men. The most heartbreaking part was how banal and short term their goals were. When confronted with infinite and wondrous reality, they chose to seek quarterly profits, personal fame, or national aggrandizement. The human condition could be so infuriatingly sad sometimes. And I think that quote, I'm, I'm curious to hear, you know, it's like such a nugget of mm. wisdom within a, a book. It doesn't give anything away, but it's one of those things mm -hmm. that you're like, oh, I see that in the world. I'm just curious just to, to hear like how you think about that as it relates to the real world. Yeah, so that, that makes me think of two things. Um, so, you know, the, the first is, is basically ambition. Um, one, of the, one of the things I was, I noticed in, in the world before working on this book, was just, you know, I have friends who, friends like you, who are doing incredible work, um, uh, both reporting on and explaining the underlying trends that are at work in the world right now. Um, friends who, who write software that billions of people use or make products that billions of people use. Friends who have dedicated their lives to public service. Friends who are artists. I mean, I'm a writer. I know a lot of other writers, right? Um, and, and what's interesting is it's very easy to look at the world and see all of those as totally separate spheres, right? Like, oh, like you make, you, you make music, like that's, that's, its own, that's its own little world, its own little, little industry, it, its own uh, sphere. Oh, you work in policy, that's its own place. You work in academia or you're a researcher, that's its own place. It sometimes can feel like the, the world is segregated into these sort of interest groups or professions or whatever you want to call them, almost like subreddits on Reddit, right? Yeah. Um, but like the, the, 
the feeling that people bring to their work and what motivates them is so that's all shared right so it's it's like if you like like my friends who are who are trying to uh, you know, make a product that will improve people's lives or like make something easier, make a tool that's really useful that you can use to make better things or friends who are trying to get a law passed that, you know, will really make an impact on improving social outcomes for a huge, for a whole region or, uh, you know, someone who's making a movie. Um, like, like, underlying the people who are seeking to make those big changes who are shooting for the moon, you have this burning ambition. And that ambition is a big part of, of what drives us, right? Um, it's, so ambition is this beautiful thing. It's, the, it's what inspires us to like reach, reach beyond what's here, to say, you know what? Like, this is how the world is today. It's not good enough we can make it better, right? Whether better means um, a, a, a new, like a, an incredible new painting that, that you know, creates a new kind of perspective or an essay that, that spreads an idea that, that everyone desperately needs right now um, or a vaccine that, uh, you know, that beats back a virus. Like all of those things are the result of like, not that many people like you know like behind each one who who really have this this hunger this this need this desire to make the world better to see what's broken and try to do you know actually play an active role in fixing it and that's a beautiful thing and it's also a really it can be a really dangerous thing right because if you actually want to make a positive change in the world, you have to figure out how to make a change in the world. And mm -hmm. the world is really complicated, right? Like there are all these feedback loops that no individual human can ever fully comprehend. So even if you are trying to be thoughtful, even if you are trying to be considerate, um, you know, almost by definition, if to the extent that you succeed in achieving your ambition, you will likewise succeed in creating a bunch of unintended side effects. And, uh, and, and I think that that is this really interesting um, part of, of like what it means alive. to be human. Yeah, yeah, what does it mean to be alive? Right, what does it mean to be alive? And, and I think that is amplified by technology that, that um, now, whether you look at uh, genetic engineering, which sort of the story explores a little bit, whether you look at computing, whether you look at energy, all of these different um, aspects of, of uh, our civilization right now, um, technology basically allows us to do more, right? Like it gives humans more power in the world. Like, you, I mean, literally look around you, like we're not hunter gatherers living in a forest anymore. Our decisions have these like huge consequences for the- I don't know, I, don't you see my plant back here? You <laughs> yeah, yeah, except for Barrett. Um, <laughs> But, but yeah, like, so that means that actually, like, even though that all feels external, you can look out and you can see the effects mm -hmm. of how technology has changed what it, like, our, what it means to live and how different our lives are from our great grandparents. Um, it actually has this strange moral internal effect where um, it, because technology amplifies the implications, the impacts of any action we take suddenly the choices we make matter even more than they used to. Right. And those choices are an internal, that's, that's part of, that's what it means to, 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 to be more, to live a good life, right? And so to me, that is really interesting. And that's where that sort of quote comes from. And I think, you know, a second piece that's really important there that that quote plays with is time horizons, where so many people, like, so when people think that they have different goals, often they just have different time horizons. Right. So like, if you're saying like, well, I want to, you know, uh, like well, even right now. Let's, oh, talk about some, let's talk about some real world examples, right? Because yeah, I think yeah, there's yeah. pretty interesting examples in the tech industry of people trying to do that, right? So like Elon Musk taking Twitter private, right? Mm -hmm. Like this, the, the thing about, you know, about avoiding, that you're saying that I think is very interesting that a, a lot of entrepreneurs, inventors, whatever it might be come up against is 
you have this idea and this creation that you're trying to bring into the world. And because of the way that society is designed to help form and grow technologies mm -hmm. through companies, mm -hmm. they wind up getting into this like rat race to raise more money and raise more money and always needing more funding because they always need to be growing and they always need to be getting bigger and they always need to be adding more customers and they're being measured on a quarterly basis, right? So mm -hmm. that is something that I think, you know, is always there. It's not necessarily like the decision of any one entrepreneur, but it's primary, mm -hmm. like it's one of the primary ways to start a company in our society or just to, to bring your idea in, even into the world in our society. And so to see people, you know, Michael Dell chose to, to move right, right. Dell back from being public to private for that reason. Mm -hmm. I think that's what Elon is hoping to do with Twitter, or he's hoping that it will kind of allow them to set different goalposts for themselves. Um, and I mean, similarly, that's why Yvonne Chouinard has famously kept Patagonia private for right, so long, right? right? Because he doesn't want the systemic pressure of uh, you know, quarterly reports and, and public shareholders uh, breathing down his neck. Um, yeah, no, I mean, I think that's profoundly important. I think that like one thing that's always important to remember is how arbitrary all of the, like those systems are like they're human inventions just as much as Speaking Twitter. My is. language, Elliot. Did you right? know that we <laughs> were talking earlier about how I'm how yeah, exactly. on this global report about that exact topic. It precisely. And, and so, you know, I think that sometimes it feels like received wisdom. Like this is just how the world works. So right. like that, this is just how corporations form and people forget right. that like the modern really corporation, that. even as an really? idea is a couple hundred yeah. years old and like it, like all, like all of the, the ways in which we have collectively chosen to like split things between, oh, like, you know, for example, if we're talking about a new piece of science or technology, like, oh, the government is sort of like funding research up to a certain point. And then at that point, it's sort of often handed off or spun out into mm -hmm. a startup company that then gets venture capital fund. Like all, that whole life cycle of stuff is completely arbitrary. It can be really effective at certain things, but, um, but it, but like the, all of the incentives that are that are set up at each one of those goalposts is uh, like disincentivizes a lot of things that would be great for the world. Like there are right. so many pieces of amazing science that are just like 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 on a shelf, uh, so, not going so anywhere. Kim yeah. Kim Stanley Robinson, who I know you know and and I, and I know and is very one of my mm -hmm. favorite science fiction authors spoke at FIRE this year and our, our annual conference. And one of the things, he had this line in there that just like really hit me, mm. you know? And his perspective, his last book is all about how do you reshape society yeah. so that to deal with clim the climate emergency yep. and yep. what does that look like? How do you build new global systems? You know, like what would it actually take to deal with a lot of that stuff? It's kind of like his giant, as, as Sally Anderson put it to me recently, it's like his gift to society. It's like, yeah. Here, this is everything I know. Please read it. And like, <laughs> that's a good way to describe it. But his, his, he, in his interview, he said this thing about, you know, we have to change this perspective on, on the lens on growth, right? Yeah. It's not about bounty, like endless growth of, of, you know, profits or we have to make the, the focus and the goal of the way that society is defined growth of biodiversity right growth of human happiness growth of uh the ability to be housed and taken care of and fed uh growth of sustainable food systems and sustainable agriculture growth of rainforest and if you change the levers and the mechanisms around that like what kind of growth we're measuring i thought it was a just like a very eloquently put easy reframe of how society currently thinks about growth versus how we would need to think about growth in order to sustain ourselves as a successful species on earth for the next 400 years, right? Or whatever it might be. Yeah, I think that's beautiful. I mean, I, I love, I mean, I love Stan's work and, um, and I think that's absolutely right. I mean, I think that there's this funny thing with growth where uh, like, as a, as a word, like if you, so as an example, um, uh, there has been an extraordinary amount of growth in like the amount of stuff to read on the internet, mm -hmm. right? Like 
no one can argue with that. Content. Like, right. Um, like, does that make your experience of the internet better? Well, for me, like having a lot of stuff is only better if I can find the better stuff, right? right? Like the stuff that's, that, that I want, that's good for me. So in a certain sense, it's good to have a lot because there's going to be more that might be perfect for me and more that might be perfect for you. But at the same time, there is just an, an, a ludicrous amount of like hot air on right. the internet where people are just trying to like game Google. Mm -hmm. Right. And like, just like filling content. It's right? amazing like, how many, how many full industries there are around like just the manipulation that. of, right. of Google search results. Right. No, no. I mean, it, it's shocking the amount of like the quantity of material of content on the internet that is just that it's just meant to be content, like not, yeah. not something not that's actually, worth reading yeah. or watching or anything just to exist. That is a, to me, that reeks of like the bad kind of viral growth, mm -hmm. right? Like, 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 like biologically, it's like you. Like the like, metrics oh, are broken. It's a parasite. Yeah. yeah. Um, on the other hand, like, uh, like everyone watching or listening to this conversation, like, at one point was born, <laughs> right? And like, <laughs> and like yeah. they've. You've we're, grown we're, a lot. Like whoever we're, you are, you were born. Like you might not have kids, but like okay. you were born yourself. I'm, I'm with you. I'm with yeah. you. <laughs> so, yeah, we're, we're we're casting a wide net here, <laughs> um, and uh, and you grew to become the person you are today. You didn't grow in the same way that content grew on the internet. There there isn't there aren't millions of clones of you that are just like worse. <laughs> right. um, I mean, I think like, what you're re what it sounds like what you're referencing is the ability to grow better instead of more precisely. Abundant. It's it, it's exactly. It's not and, that every one of us has gotten better since we were born. No, but, you can no, grow like, in a negative way too. We've but, evolved and changed. Right. And, exactly. Yeah. But it but like the world like if we're like growth is a metaphor regardless. And if we're going to use it as a metaphor, like let's use it as a metaphor where we can grow better rather than just grow more. And sometimes those are interrelated. Sometimes it's better to have more. Sometimes it's more, you know, like that, like that, that's not necessarily bad. But I think that that's something where, you know, sort of especially like the 20th century industrial capitalism logic of just mm -hmm. like, we have factories. How can we increase yield? Like right. that is like so simplistic. It doesn't reflect like the reality that we live in and so if we try to cling to that logic because it was a it's an easy idea to explain um or it's an easy kpi to chase um like we're gonna wind up in a bad spot like we actually you have to look at the real world and react to it as it is rather than simply sort of like run off an outdated theory so we're about out of time um, and I want to make sure that uh, everyone goes out and buys a copy of your book uh, because it's That'll be great. <laughs> amazing and it will help you grow as a person, not in quantity, but in quality. Right. There we go. <laughs> there is no content. <laughs> no, it's actually yeah, no. content that you will enjoy, right. yeah. created for your benefit and not just for your banal consumption. Um, I want to read one last quote because I think it's a good one to end on. Um, uh, from, it's from later on in the book, but it's talking about humans and the nature of, of society and interconnectedness. Every living being was a world unto themselves, densely interconnected, interdependent at every scale, deserving of respect and simple kindness, even if it was nothing more than a trio of strangers offering a helping hand. And I think, you know, that is one of the things, Elliot, that I really respect and value about you as a person, not just a writer. I think that's a very beautifully written line, but you very much focus in all of your interpersonal reactions on being a good person, doing the right thing as much as you can, as we've described in this conversation. Um, and so I think I just wanted to end on that line because it kind of captures your, who you are as a person, as well as the beauty of your writing. Well, that that means a lot. You just gave me goosebumps, um, <laughs> and uh, that just makes me 
to close the final loop here, it makes me think back to one thing you said earlier saying, oh, you should write more, you know, like write more positive <laughs> novels, right? Like, and I was like, okay, I promised to write utopias. And um, the thing that I always try to seek whenever I'm working on a, on a new book, on a, on a new story is that, is, is that regardless of how, um, of how difficult or extreme the external world in the novel gets, right? Of like what's going on there. Um, that, and, and like regardless of how useful it is as a novelist to have people who do bad things, right? right? Like, I mean, murder mysteries are popular for a reason. Um, that, that so much of what drives us is, is really beautiful and rarely seen in the news. Like we see it, like we so often do selfless favors for friends right. um, and family. Like we, we, like, like you're so off, like everyone is so kind to each, like, like our natural inclination is to be so kind to the people around us. And I think that sometimes we mislead ourselves when we think about the lar like the abstract larger world that's beyond our personal like sphere. Mm -hmm. um, that somehow that that uh, people, the people are, out people there, here, are, yeah, the people out there are all are bad. like right. They're all cheating each other and corrupt yeah. and like doing all these nasty things. Um, but like the people in my life are like you know we all bring something delicious to the potluck, right? right. Um, and I and and I think that. Um, I think every, like almost everyone, not everyone, there are definitely some jerks out there and we all know that, but that most people bring something delicious to the potluck. Um, it's, it's always amazing to me throughout history, how much of history is driven by just like a couple really shitty people. Yeah, you know, yeah like, exactly. Through evil, because of the, because humans are actually majority kind, it makes it in some ways it makes it easier for people who really are truly evil or manipulative or power seeking to like rise to the top yeah like lies only work because most of the time we tell the truth right, <laughs> right? Like, like they actually wouldn't work if that wasn't true <laughs> um so i yeah so i just think that's so important to remember and that's really something i reach for um in in my novels too because it's just true it's 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 who we are as a species and it's a beautiful thing well thank you so much for your time this has been a, a like really fantastic and very fun conversation as always i miss our editorial meetings um i do too we need to we, we should just have we them, should anyway. Do them anyway yeah. it's formal. maybe we could just do video editorial meetings perfect <laughs> okay so reaper is coming out may 18th you can buy it where where, where would you recommend folks go uh, you can buy it anywhere uh, at your local bookstore. I mean, like Amazon's easy. Uh, you can get it there too. Okay. Thanks, Elliot. <laughs> Thank you. Have a fantastic day. You too.